Okay, with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Jeffrey Kahn. Dr. Kahn is the director of the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. New medicines, biomedical procedures, and ways of altering plants and animals are bringing benefits to millions of people around the world. However, these same innovations also have the potential for negative consequences or to raise other kinds of ethical questions about their appropriate use. Bioethics is the multidisciplinary study of and response to these moral and ethical questions. Welcome, Dr. Khan. Thanks, Bridget. And thank you um, for inviting me and, and uh, welcome to all of you who are joining the webinar. I'm gonna talk for maybe 10 minutes. There are a bunch of slides, but I'll go through them very quickly. Just to give you a flavor of the work that um, we do at the Berman Institute and that I do in particular. Um, this is a, a repetition of that previous slide, but I wanted to put it up because it shows our social media presence and, and my um, Twitter handle, for instance. So if you're interested, feel free to follow us. Um, there's lots of content there for those of you who are media savvy, which I, social media savvy, which I assume is many, if not all of you. All right, so let me just talk for a few um, moments here about what bioethics is. So you heard in Bridget's introduction, a kind of general um, statement of, of what we do, and that was um, helpful, and I hope you got a clear sense. But it, uh, it's a focus on the ethics of medicine, biomedical research, public health, and life sciences, and in increasingly very broadly construed, frankly, all of these things. So what started out as ethics of medicine, delivering uh, medical care, um, has broadened substantially. And we still call it bioethics, but it's um, an increasingly broad territory. We work at the Berman Institute and as academics in bioethics on research and scholarship. So that's right, doing, doing research projects and then publishing the results. Uh, we teach, we teach mostly in the graduate school. So mostly in the school of public health, but also a little bit in the arts and sciences undergraduate curriculum. And we do a fair amount of um, policy and outreach both to the, to the public and to policymakers. And that's in some sense a real um, feature of the Berman Institute's work and partly as a function of the people who we have and um, the fact that we're so close to Washington DC and of course the, the centers of power and policymaking there. So let me give you just a few quick examples of the territories. These are not with a lot of examples of um, actual projects, but to give you a sense. So clinical ethics is what we used to call medical ethics. And, and two examples you see there um, are sort of showing you what we, what we think about in the territory of clinical ethics, so ethics around the delivery of healthcare bedside kinds of ethics. Ethics of research, which has to do with um, clinical research mostly, so ethics of research involving human subjects. So all the conversation and discussion about getting COVID vaccines developed and then brought to market. Of course, there's a lot of talk about how to allocate them now that they have been approved under emergency use but the, the research process has all sorts of ethical issues embedded in it. So that's what research ethics includes in addition to the other bullet you see there. And then we also work again, somewhat uniquely on public health ethics. So ethics in the context of not individual health but health of the community, health of the health of groups, health, health of the population which we call public health. So things like whether we should mandatorily require vaccines is a kind of public health ethics question or, or privacy and the relationship between that and contact tracing is another ethics and public health question, both of which of course are relevant in the COVID outbreak and its response. And then the, the fourth territory that we claim in one of our areas of, of focus is ethics and science. So that's more in the laboratory and the bench and, and things like the use of gene editing tools like CRISPR, which I'm gonna talk about more in a second. So this gives you a sense of the breadth of the work that we do. And this doesn't really even capture everything that we do. We have a program in food ethics, for instance, which doesn't really fit neatly into one of these four, but cuts across. So I'm going to talk now for a few more minutes about a few examples of work I have engaged in over the course of the last few years that are, are not COVID related. So the last 10 months, we have done almost nothing but COVID related work. Um, and I'm certainly happy to talk about that as part of the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense of some other kinds of work. And I, I chose things that I hope you'll find engaging and interesting and give you a, a flavor of the kind of work that 
people um, like me do. So uh, this, this is my own examples. So there's lots of other examples. We have 40 some faculty in the Berman Institute, but I wanted to talk about my work with you now. So um, I've been very involved with the work related uh, to international governance of the tools like CRISPR, genome editing tools, and in particular, their application to human use. So this is a, sorry, a little bit blurry screenshot of the cover of a report issued by the National Academies of Science, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, um, to which I, I'm a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and I um, do a fair amount of work with them on a whole bunch of different issues. I served on the committee that issued this report. Give you a sense of the kind of work that that committee and others like it do. This is not to go through it all, but a sense of the kinds of, of high level recommendations that uh, international um, committees are convened to take on when it comes to the use of human genome editing tools with humans. So this is meant to be a checklist for what would need to be um, uh, agreed to by consensus as having been being both um, uh, present in the, a particular case and the scientific um, status of the work being done on the use of, of human genome editing tools on human embryos. So notice this says criteria for heritable germline editing, that is editing that would be passed from individuals to their offspring and then their offspring's offspring and so on. That's called germline editing, just to give you a sense. So a screenshot you may be familiar with of um, three, three photos, obviously, from the um, International Summit on Human Genome Editing in Hong Kong. This was in um, November of 2018, where this, this doctor, Dr. J.K. He, announced that he had successfully used genome editing tools to modify um, human embryos, and twins were born from that process. It was where it was first announced. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I'm moving around here. I'm sitting over here where this white block is, and I was in the audience that day. I was a, um, participating later in the program. This was a very big international story, of course, leading to lots of concern and consternation about why this happened. So the, the ethics of using this tool in the way that he did was, of course, a big focus of what followed. The recommendations of that report that I showed you articulated when it could go forward and he had not followed any of those rules and we were quite worried and the world was quite worried that that would be what would happen more broadly. Rogue scientists would take these tools into their own hands and use them in ways that hadn't been uh, agreed to, right, whatever that meant, whatever that means. And, and can countries control that? Can there be an international consensus about how to control that are among the questions that I uh, work a lot on. Um, when the, um, the story came out that Dr. He had done what he did, uh, there was a lot of concern. The Chinese government ended up cracking down on him, and then everybody thought that might be the end. But of course, it wasn't the end, isn't the end. A Russian scientist announced that he was willing to use the same technique for anybody who would bring him um, enough money to do so. So come to Moscow and I'll do whatever you ask. Russian government has been a little bit coy about whether they will permit that. The point being, this is really hard to control, and that's a big issue that I've been working on for the last few years. A recent international commission that I also served on tried to answer this question from an international governance perspective. We just issued this report in September of last year, just to give you a sense of the kind of work that I do. All right, switching gears. Second example, and I only have three, this one will be quicker. In 2011, I was asked to chair a committee of the National Academies on behalf of the National Institutes of Health about whether the NIH should continue to use chimpanzees in biomedical research. Very controversial question, as you might guess. Never had there been a question about whether to stop using a particular species in biomedical research. Um, and there was a lot of focus on this particular question because it wasn't, um, it was about chimpanzees, but the thought was if it's about chimpanzees and whatever we decided could easily be, the answer could easily be applied to other species as well. So a lot at stake about the use of animals in research and give you a sense of where the debate was very heated on both sides. It's unethical not to use this model for some indications. And then on the other side, stop using this as an excuse as essential when we're taking um, highly developed creatures that are a lot like humans and keeping them in captivity for our own purposes. So let's give you a sense of all the places that that work was happening. We made recommendations about 
effectively a very high bar being set for when that research should go forward. Not important so much what it says here, except the high, the, uh, the all bold and cap statement at the bottom of this slide that all of these recommendations were adopted by the director of the NIH on the day the report was released. It's a very big deal for the director of the NIH to accept and implement pretty much instantly the recommendations that had been issued. Uh, here's a quote from him on that day. Um, this is a sort of home run in the world of policy work related to, to science. Um, and so very um, happy to have been part of that. Um, not only was this well received by the members of the community who are trying to protect the use of animals, the scientific community was actually fairly on board as well. Um, and, and subsequent to the report being issued, a decision took a number of years, but a decision was reached in 2015 to discontinue the use of all chimpanzees in biomedical research funded by the NIH and retire those animals to so-called sanctuary. Um, one of the things I like to show when I talk about this particular issue is this photo. This is Jane Goodall, of course, who's a quite you know, famous, more than famous person. She's nearly a saint um, for all the work she has done in conservation and particular protection of chimpanzees. I like to show this picture because she hates to have her picture taken with people and she asks not to have that happen. I was at a reception where she was about to speak and she saw me there and she said to the photographer, please come over and take a picture with me and Jeff. I want a picture with Jeff. So a, a real proud moment for me. I look a little bit younger than even though it was only a few years ago. That's what a few years of, of age plus COVID does to you, I guess. All right, last one, this will be even quicker, just to give you a sense of the kind of interesting stuff that I get to work on. This is a, a slide um, of a, another committee I was asked to chair related to exposing astronauts to risk in long duration space flight that is going to places like Mars. And what, the, what NASA ought to do to um, protect astronauts, but knowing full well that it's impossible to predict how much risk there is for things that we haven't done before. So really interesting work related to the use of um, of ethics as a tool to help NASA decide what's an acceptable risk and how to engineer, how to think about standards, um, how to think about consent uh, before sending people out to deep um, space. So we gave them a few options as it's noted here, the three things that could be done in terms of health standards and long duration space flight. I will tell you that we settled on that third bullet as the really the only acceptable one. Liberalizing existing standards means you really don't have any standards creating more permissive standards for things that are riskier doesn't seem right either. So we said, you need to just think about this as short-term exceptions until you can engineer your way out of these problems um, and do as much as you can to keep people safe. Um, if we're going to send people into harm's way um, before we can keep them um, as safe as we would like. The, the upshot of this was among other things, a passage of law actually in 2017, early in the Trump administration, which is a little surprising for many people to hear, about whether astronauts should get lifetime health care from NASA. It turns out before this, they did not. Very surprising for most people that astronauts, when they leave the astronaut corps, are either covered by the VA, the Veterans Administration, if they're members of the military. Um, but in, now something like half of astronauts are actually civilians, and those individuals were not covered. They had to go find health insurance from whatever um, you know, their employer or whatever means they could find. So that didn't seem right to us and it took many years, but um, in 2017, that law was passed. So a, a really happy ending to that story as well. All right, that's the end of my slides. I took a little, maybe a few more minutes than I said I would, but not too many more. Let me stop sharing. We get to be bigger on the screen and, um, and Bridget, I guess we can go straight to questions at this point. Sure, thank you so much. That was, that was great. I love the picture of you and Jane Goodall, how special that is. Um, I, I do have a couple questions regarding advice that you might have for students sure. that are interested in bioethics and want to get involved. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I didn't do this as part of my, my the first slide, but let me tell you just two, two seconds worth of my own background because that helps answer the question a little bit or inform the answer to the question. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, my undergraduate degree was in molecular biology from um, UCLA. <clears throat> Pardon me. I grew up in Southern California. I went to college at UCLA and I was actually a pre-med student thinking I would go to medical school and pursued a pre-medical curriculum. Um, 
I ended up working at UCLA Hospital in the blood bank. And among the things I did as a, a staff there was phlebotomy, that is go and draw blood from people who were in the hospital. I did that every day on the evening shift um, as a way of sort of getting some experience in a clinical setting as well as the laboratory experience I was getting in the blood bank. I, I found myself being really uh, questioning the decision about going into medicine. I didn't like going into the hospital. Of course, I was only you know, 20 years old, 19 years old, so I probably was a little young to be making life changing decisions, but I, I was really questioning whether to go to medical school, took a course as a senior um, in college called Medicine, Law, and Society, which was a bioethics course before we knew that term, before we had that term, and found that to be really engaging and interesting, and the issues of, um, of medicine that I found really interesting without the issues of going into the hospital. So I decided to go get a PhD in philosophy, which shocked my parents. Um, having been a pre-med, I applied to and ended up in a doctoral program in philosophy at Georgetown, where there um, was and still is a focus on bioethics called the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. Did my PhD there, uh, focusing on applied moral philosophy. And while I was writing my dissertation there, I actually came to Hopkins to do a master's in public health because I was quite interested in health policy um, and didn't have that uh, training available to me as a PhD student in philosophy. So all by way of saying, I put together science and philosophy and public health. And that's turns out to be a really good combination for doing the kind of work that I have done. I started as a faculty member in 1989 to give you a sense of my, my um, age demographic. Um, and at, at, over that time, the field has evolved pretty dramatically. There are now many more programs even at the undergraduate level, people can do bioethics as a, a minor for sure, at, including at Hopkins, as a major um, increasing number of places. <clears throat> there are master's degree programs, we have one at Hopkins, um, and in, increasing paths for people to do bioethics as an area, a disciplinary area of study. So okay. there are lots of ways now, increasing ways, and we work with students actually starting in high school students who are interested reach out to us and we help them in summer projects and things and they help us and so there are lots of opportunities from earlier and earlier in education for um, tracking to focus on things like bioethics now my colleagues come from across a wide range of discipline disciplinary training we have physicians we have um, people who are trained more like i am with phds in philosophy or other humanities or social science disciplines um, sociology, anthropology. We have people who are trained in public health, doctoral training in public health. We had people who are trained in um, doctoral level, in, in, as doctoral level nursing degrees. And we have a few who are JDs as well. So we have a very interdisciplinary group and that's important for our work because we all learn from each other, um, you know, all the time. Um, so interdisciplinarity, I think is sort of the key piece. There isn't sort of one path um, and people should pursue you know, the things that they're really interested in, and then merge together various, um, you know, emphases as a way of pursuing things like bioethics. So I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody who's interested in, in more for their particulars, but that's, I think, a general overview. Hopefully that's speaking to the question, Bridget. Yeah, that's, that's great. And it's good to know that there's um, interdisciplinary as colleagues that you're working with, so you have that diversity of thought, diversity of thought at, at work, and and not just people coming from the STEM fields or people just coming from the humanities. So that's a really great um, opportunity to work with a lot of different types of people. Um, how, how do you think that bioethics has affected or changed and helped people improve the work and research around cardiology? Cardiology. That's an interesting one. <clears throat> You know, when I was in uh, graduate school, it was a very early um, work on artificial heart and the, the issues related to um, when it was appropriate to have people um, participate effectively as very, very early stage research subjects on a brand new device that might keep them alive. And there were some pretty um, challenging stories of individuals who were among the first to have those implanted in their chests. Um, and, and the ethics of doing that, like how much consent do, what does consent look like in something that's totally experimental, um, never done before in a human? And how do we make sure that people understand what it is that they're um, participating? And so I guess one answer would be 
you know, work on informed consent and how to think about the ethics of individual decision making for novel um, therapies and, and devices would be one answer. Um, about other kinds of examples of, of cardiology, I participated on a, a data safety and monitoring board a number of years ago related to um, implantable defibrillators and the um, it was a clinical trial that there was really interesting data coming out of, but it was also very clear that the people who were getting the, the particular device were doing much better. Their death rates were much lower than people who were being treated medically just with drugs. Um, and so we had to stop the trial, we thought on ethics grounds, um, even though more data might have been gained by letting the trial continue longer, it, it wasn't, we, we didn't think ethically appropriate to allow more people to die when they should have been offered this device and since it seemed to be so clearly um, life-saving. So those are two kinds of examples where bioethics has had um, some role to play. I don't know if it's made cardiology better, but at least those are examples of ethics and cardiology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that brings up another question that we received about voluntary cons or individual consent. Um, someone asked that, you know, so many people are on waiting lists for new organs and die because they don't receive them. What is the conversation around people who, uh, or, is, or is it ethical, which I know, I think I know the answer, but is it ethical to take organs when people die, even if they don't state that they wanted to be organ donors? I guess this is more of a question about that individual consent and greater good, maybe? Yeah, um, there's a long standing debate in our country and actually in other countries as well. And it's, in, I think, important or, or informative to examine what other countries do in this area as well as, you know, what we might do. <clears throat> so it, in the United States, um, there is no um, taking of organs from deceased donors with, without their consent. We, we require there to be consent of the individual or of their family members if the, there's no clarity, no clear decision by the individual. And, and we don't say, well, it's a really important resource. We can't let it go to waste and we'll take it whether or not the individual can consent. We don't, we don't, we have not done that in this country. Um, in other places, they actually presume consent. So you have to opt out. So our system is an opt in system. You have to, um, at least in Maryland and um, I bet many other states um, are, uh, where people are sitting now, um, you, when you go to the DMV or the MVA as it's called here in Maryland, the motor vehicle, uh, administration and get your driver's license, you're asked at that time whether you want to be an organ donor. And if you are, then it shows up on your, your driver's license. It's a little bit of an odd place, you know, we've, if you think about it, to ask people about whether they want to be an organ donor, but everybody gets a driver, not everybody, but a lot of the population gets a driver's license at, at you know, sort of early in their, um, their adulthood. And so it's, it's a place that seems like a, a, a place everybody has to pass through. And we require people to make a decision, but it's it's an opt-in. Uh, other countries, Spain being most notable, is an opt-out country. Mm -hmm. So unless you say you don't want your organs um, removed after you die for for transplant, then um, they will be, and and that yields more organs, as you might guess. And so um, in a country like ours, which is very devoted to individual decision making and liberty, right? Death and taxes, right? Is the old. Mm -hmm saying are the only two things you have to do, um, required to pay taxes and die at some point. <laughs> That's a kind of um, statement about whether we would, without people's um, agreement, do anything other you know, than those two things. So, um, so far we haven't crossed that line. There's always discussion because as, as the question implied, more people want um, are waiting for organs and there are organs available. And so anything that might increase the supply is something that we, we talk about a lot in the organ transplant policy and ethics discussions and, and debates. One other thing to say about that is increasing numbers of at least kidneys come from living donors. So you have two kidneys, Most, almost everybody has two kidneys. Some people are born with only one, but that's very, very rare. Um, you can live perfectly fine with only one kidney. And so if you want to be a living kidney donor, and mostly this happens within families or people who at least know each other, um, an individual can give one of their kidneys to somebody and um, that can be transplanted and, and people do very well. I think that we're getting close to 40% of the kidney 
transplants performed in the US come from living kidney donors. So that's really helped the supply. The difference there is when somebody um, is an organ donor after they die, those organs are allocated out through a, a, a system of waiting list and severity of illness. They're thought of as a community or a public good or public resource. Living donors get to decide who receives their organ. Right? It's almost all kidneys. A little, a little bit of partial liver donation happens that way as well for transplant. But the difference being when you die, the, the um, society decides how to allocate. If you're living and you want to give a kidney, you get to decide to whom it will go, which is a really interesting difference. But the, the difference being we get to decide what happens to our bodies when we're alive. We, we don't after we die, at least by policy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't know that there were other countries that had the opt out um, option. So that's really interesting. Um, in, in the cases of rare and significantly debilitating illnesses, do you think that preserving life or the possibility of research for a cure is more important and why? Hmm. Well, I, I think both are actually important and the way that um, I think we think about it is the individuals get to decide for themselves. Um, so nobody's forced to undergo medical care. And if you're considered of you know, sound mind um, and uh, can make autonomous decisions um, for yourself, then you can refuse life-saving medical care of any kind. And, and sometimes it's, it's puzzling um, and there's psychiatric consults brought in and things, but people are free to refuse. So individuals should get to decide. There shouldn't be a kind of, you know, forced on people one way or the other. You, you, you know, your life is not worth saving on one end of the spectrum, or we think you have to be treated um, whether you want to be or not. We don't, we don't do that. And that's a, um, a, a translation of, um, or a, um, a way of implementing a commitment to respect for individual decision-making and um, autonomy that people get to decide for themselves. So it goes back to what I said before, that we're very committed to liberty and individual decision-making in, in our society. And it gets reflected in the um, healthcare and medical context by the, the uh, um, commitment to allow people to decide for themselves. Similarly, we don't require people to participate in research. It's all voluntary. You're recruited, you're asked whether you wanna participate, you're told you, know, you can withdraw any time, assuming it's something you can easily withdraw from, um, but it's all, it's all by, you know, a decision has to be made by that individual to do that thing. There's no um, requirement to do so. Um, and we only sort of cross over into mandatory things when we get into public health, frankly. And we can talk a little bit about that if anybody is interested, if it's in your list of questions. Right. Um, we do have a, a couple of the, the heavier questions or he other heavy questions too, but a lot of questions about, um, about you and your typical day, uh, you know, pre-COVID, what would your typical day yeah. be um, as a bioethicist? I, you know, I get that question a lot, which I, I take partly to be like, we don't really understand what people who are called, you know, bioethicist or bioethics professor do. Um, but I always think, you know, I, I, there isn't such a thing as a typical day. So, and I don't know, frankly, that it's unique to, you know, doing the kind of work I do, or whether it's, it's more just about um, academic life. And in particular, it's a little, you know, I'm, I'm a particular strain of academic life because I am a faculty member at the university and in the Berman Institute and in the School of Public Health, but I'm also an administrator. So I have responsibility for making sure that the Berman Institute continues to, to run properly and that we, you know, our budget works and that our faculty are advancing appropriately and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it's a combination, I guess, if I had to answer the question, a typical day for me is, you know, probably half of it is spent doing administrative stuff of various kinds. Um, and then, you know, maybe a third um, is devoted to my funded research. So among the things that are true for people um, like me at Hopkins and a wide um, swath of Hopkins faculty is that we work on research that's funded by the, the government or a, a private foundation or sometimes by, sometime by philanthropy. Um, and so you we're paid to spend a certain amount of our um, effort, of our time, performing 
um, funded research. Um, so maybe that's another 30% of my time. I, I don't teach every day, but I have some you know, time in the classroom over the course of a, of a week. Um, and then, you know, so to add all this up, there's not very much time left. And so like, when do people write papers and, um, you know, book chapters or, or whole books or, you know, articles that will be published in journals. And so that tends to happen in the, in the off time, in the evenings, you know, sometimes late into the evening. So it's among the things I think it's important for people to know that we, we don't punch clocks, right? We are um, working a lot um, either in the office or out of the office. Although these days, everything is all blended together in and out of the office, of course. But, you know, we're working many, many hours in many different um, part, aspects of our lives um, across, you know, days, nights, sometimes weekends. Um, so, I, that's a long answer without really a lot of satisfying. <laughs> what is your every? What is a typical day for you like? Um, right. There isn't really a typical day, but I like it that way. Right. Yeah, I understand. I'm a PI for a grant right now, and I that's the only time that's actually accounted for is when I'm working on a grant. Exactly. I spent gotta, this much time sure on do it. that first right. and foremost. <laughs> Exactly. You got to uh, keep that grant going. So, um, but speaking of some of the funded research or, or any of the research that you've done, um, what, what does that research involve? Are you in a lab? Are you reading literature? Are you, you know, interviewing people? What, how are you doing that research? Yeah, it, not, not much lab, as you might guess, because we, you know, we're not a lab based. The, the disciplines that I mentioned to you that are part of, you know, bioethics and the faculty who work in the Berman Institute aren't really lab-based. Um, but you know, sometimes, so there's, maybe I'll just broad categories. We, we, there's research that we are the, um, the, the principal investigator. So we write the grants or we write the proposal that leads to the project. And that, so there are projects that we take on because they're interesting to us and they have an ethics and policy um, angle to them. Um, and I'll, I'll say something about that in a second, but the other category is when we are part of, of other people's projects. So we're, we do the ethics component of what may be a more laboratory oriented project. Um, and so, you know, so there's really interesting, there's, there are really interesting ethical issues in some cutting edge science areas. So I mentioned genome editing very, very briefly, but there's, there's really interesting work, not, so this is not um, Hopkins specific, but for instance, there's now increasing amounts of work where it's actually termed embedded, embedded ethics. So an ethics person is embedded in the laboratory. So there was recently a report in the last year, recently, of work uh, mostly done at Yale, um, where pig, heads of pigs from a slaughterhouse, so decapitated heads of pigs that had been you know, slaughtered for, for meat, were um, brought to the laboratory at Yale and perfused. So um, a, a particular cocktail of chemicals were put through the veins that fed the brain of these decapitated pig heads. And they got, after much work, of course, the neurons to start to, to fire again in the <laughs> brains of these decapitated pig heads. So okay. they, you know, my goodness. So they reanimated at some level the neural activity of decapitated heads of a fairly developed animal, right? A pig is not a, not a, you know, a rodent. That's a, that's a significant um, animal. And so the, that project had an ethics person embedded in the laboratory with them because they were concerned about, well, will, will the pig head start to experience something? You know, are we reanimating it to the extent that it might experience pain? Right might suffer somehow, even though there's no body attached, you know, what are we doing? And so there are ethical issues in the laboratory work that sometimes we get to work on. And then there are issues that we lead. So just one quick example, uh, I'm a, the, the PI, the principal investigator on an NIH funded project that's looking at the intersection of ethics, genetics and infectious disease. So really interesting issues, in fact, related to COVID at the moment. There seem to be some people who get much sicker than others, and it, there's now some work showing that there's probably a genetic link for at least explaining some of that, where some people who have a particular genetic mutation will get sicker or are at risk of getting sicker if they get infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus than other people who don't have that mutation. So what does that mean for how we think about prioritization of, of therapy 
a vaccine now that it's available. So should we do genetic screening on populations and then decide how to allocate something because of that predisposition? So that's an example of the kind of work that we do, which is not lab-based by any means. It's more um, analyzing issues. Sometimes it's literature review, sometimes it's interviewing people, sometimes it's, in, it's expert working groups, but those are the, the kinds of things we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of questions, as you can imagine, coming in about COVID and, and ethics questions that you've had to face on the past 12, 15, I, I don't know how many years it feels like, but how many months it's been um, since COVID um, is taking over our lives. So are there any, uh, other than um, prioritization of vaccines and things like that, other ethics um, questions that have come up um, during the COVID period? Yeah, there definitely are. And I would count, you know, mid-March is the beginning of all this for us. Mm -hmm. So what's that now? 10, 10 months in yeah. counting. Um, so one thing I didn't have on that first slide I'm thinking now as I'm answering your question is we do a lot of work for the institution as well. So there are ethical issues that arise in the, in, you know, the conduct of mostly on the biomedical side, but not exclusively so. And, and among the things that happened starting it back in March was a committee was formed for Johns Hopkins Medicine. Um, so that includes the School of Medicine and the hospitals and the hospital system to tr first try to, to work towards a framework for allocating scarce resources. If the um, numbers of patients that were coming into the hospital and the hospital system was greater than the um, ability to treat everybody with the resources that they would need. So what things would that include? Well, ICU beds, one that, that was you know high on the list then and still is, we thought ventilators were going to be in short supply. And people may remember there was this huge scramble to figure out how to create more, to build more ventilators. Mm -hmm. um, but it also then, as the um, pandemic evolved, became clear that things like dialysis was going to be in um, short supply. Something called ECMO machines, which is a very um, high tech piece of equipment that effectively not only breathes for you, but perfuses your organs too, which are even if fewer of those available than ventilators. And, and how to decide which patients should get them when there wasn't enough for all the patients who would need them. So that's, that's ethics work. Um, so we have been working at that since back in, as I said, in March, and we were meeting tw twice a day, two different hours per day, seven days a week for, for at least the first two months. It was a crazy amount of work. And then over the course of the pandemic, we've reduced the numbers of meetings, but we continue to, that group meets twice a week still and has evolved to, take, to try to take on issues of things like convalescent plasma, not enough of that. Um, monoclonal antibody, the new therapies that are coming out that are in short supply and now vaccine allocation. So it, there's no shortage of issues, sadly. Um, you know, and then there's also kind of higher level policy issues that we're getting pulled in on, which is about not just vaccine allocation, maybe more globally, but things like um, I worked on a project, letter project on digital apps and um, contact tracing technology. How do we do that in a way that's going to be mo both effective and ethically responsible? So a, a ton of issues, you know, continue to be tons of issues. And, and I would say, you know, there's a go to our website. There's actually a separate section for the COVID response that we have engaged in. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and I know you, you brought up just uh, the, the big question right now with the vaccine coming out is, you know, who's going to get the vaccine and who we should prioritize. Um, so I, I think they should certainly go to the websites and they can contact you for, for yeah. more information about that too, right? Um, do you have an opportunity? So obviously you're, I'm, I'm assuming things have been consumed for the past, let's say, 10 months um, with COVID, but in other times in your career, do you get to pick projects that you work on? Um, is there a, a committee or a protocol and, and just some issues that you choose to work on or things that are of specific interest to you? How does that work? With um, yeah, so, you know, this is a little bit about stage in career. So, I, I, you know, I'm a full professor. I have been for a long, longish time now. Um, and so I can be more selective about the things that I choose to work on. Um, funded research, you know, there's a little dance that we all play. We, we can think of the things that are most interesting to us, but we need to also find something that is interesting to the funder. 
And so we hope we can match those two things up, right? The things that we're really interested in and have the right expertise for are also things that the funders will give us um, money, invest money to, to have us perform. And so that's something that, you know, people at Hopkins are particularly good at because they have to be because of the way that we operate here. And I'm sure people know that we are the number one um, government funded institution in the, in the US, meaning in the world. So, um, you know, we're really good at it. And the people who are here have gotten to be really good at it. Um, but that's funded research. The things that are not funded, the things that, you know, are because they were interested in them, we get to, to choose. And so I do a lot of work, as you probably can tell from my slides, with the National Academies. And they um, ask me to participate in things. And I only say yes to the things that I think are interesting and engaging and important. So um, I guess the, the good news is we're lucky that there are so many things that are um, that, where our expertise can be useful. Uh, and we have lots of people who have very different kinds of expertise and also different interests. So the things that are interesting to me may not be interesting to some of my colleagues and vice versa, but that's great because we have people you know, such that we can answer almost any need that, that shows up or um, where there's institutional, you know, something going on that requires or, or where we can be helpful. Um, and, and we have somebody who's got the right expertise and the right interest. So um, a little bit of kid in the candy shop, I guess. And we all have to just, you know, choose which, which things are most interesting and um, important to us. You know, the good news of, of people who work at universities, I think all say this, but it, it's, it's, we're really lucky. We get to work on things that are really interesting and engaging to us. Um, and, I, and I would say the work we do, you know, also that makes a difference, right? We, we change um, something for the better. It's better after we've done the work than it was before. And that's a gift to be able to work in a setting like that. Right, right. It really is. Um, so with, since we have students of all different ages on the webinar or that might watch this later, if you were talking to someone in, in third, fourth grade, how would you explain in elementary school student terms like what a bioethicist is or, and does? Yeah, well, I should say you asked my kids who who had this experience when they were you know that that age with bring your parent to work or um, right. you know, whatever it was, um, and you know I, I would usually use an example um, and an example that at least would be some somewhat newsworthy or that they might have heard of or could understand, and then um, you know using some um, some pictures or some some story help exp explain that. But, you know, I, I will say from very early age, um, we know right from wrong, right? We, we, we learn that we, had, um, we have ways of making judgments. Um, and it's about using that, right? That ability to, to make moral judgments and applying it to particular, a particular area. Um, so, you know, when I was little, my mother, was, this is true, was, we would have, you know, a cake or something at, at home, um, somebody would be charged with cutting it, and that person was then the last to, to choose the piece, right? Mm -hmm. So that's just an example of justice and, and fair allocation, right? If you want an equal share, then you're going to be really careful about making the pieces equal sized, and that's about, that's ethics. And so um, I, I, the work that we do is, is exactly that kind of thing, just applied to medicine, to you know, decisions making by our government about things related to the health of the public, um, or the examples like we've talked about, organ transplantation, or you know, who gets the vaccine when there isn't enough available, and so on. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I don't know if we'd want to use the reanimated pig's head for examples. I'm no, scared I mean, a little. Maybe that's not the best one for the <laughs> third and fourth grade, but you know. I, um, I, I'm always pleasantly surprised about how sophisticated um, mm -hmm. younger people are. Right, um, especially our CTY students. They're really yeah, they're, exa yeah, exactly. So this group is an example of exactly that. So um, I don't, I don't want right. to under, um, I, I think we can ask more of them than I think mm -hmm. we, we uh, imagine. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it seems so much clearer to them what is right and wrong well, that's than, than adults. And, and I would say too, you know, the work that we do is always in, in the gray. We don't take on the really easy cases. That's not 
you don't you don't need high powered you know highly educated people for that it's the hard question so we get the hard stuff but that's what makes it interesting and there aren't almost ever easy answers it's always a little bit you know this it's complicated is almost always the answer at least the first answer and then we get into the weeds about how complicated it is and what we to, what to do in particular aspects mm -hmm. of the details mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dr. Kong, we've had a lot of questions about your publications. Like people have been thrilled with what you've shared so far. Have you, um, can you share any publications or books that you um, could recommend for people to read? Wow. I promise, I promise he didn't, he didn't ask me to do this before. <laughs> but. Well, I, I can, you know what I would say, um, one, go to the, to our website. So one, there's lots of resources there, but, and, and I, you know, there isn't just one. Um, maybe what I can do with you or you and Stacey and Katie, whomever, um, is, is put together a little, you know, reading list uh, that can be shared, put on your website, however you want to distribute it. Um, you know, the truth is you can open any newspaper, any periodical or whatever, you know, reliable website. There's, there's a bioethics question every day. Um, so there's, there are ways to sort of get exposed to the issues. Um, you know, the, the books and the materials that are available to, that are sort of the academic work are, you know, they're really university level stuff. Now that's not to say you shouldn't access them, um, but that's just by way of, that's what's been produced. Um, we haven't really got to the point where there's a kind of high school or junior high school level curriculum for this. And that's not clear to me why that's the case, but maybe because it's, you know, it's embedded in the science curriculum or for, for um, families and students who are part of like the I, in international baccalaureate program for, you know, junior and, and senior high school, the theory of knowledge component um, of the IB program has some ethics um, component to it, but it isn't sort of like, here's a whole bioethics course, right? So there doesn't need to be a textbook um, for high school or junior high school yet. So that's, I think, part of the challenge. It's all pretty high level as a result. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to ask one more question and I want to, again, apologize. We had over 150 questions come in. So no apology uh, required. I mean, apologize to the people we didn't get yeah. to answer their questions. Right. Yeah. yeah, we weren't able to get to everyone's question, but I tried to look through. Um, so there was a lot of themes around COVID and um, then very specific questions. But one question I wanted to end with and also ask you to show your contact info slide again. Um, sure. But the, the last question I'd like to, to ask you is where do you see the field going in the future? What, what, um, what, what's, not, what's, in, what's in store? You know, um... I'm not good at crystal ball stuff is part of the answer, unfortunately. Let me just get to the, also not good at multitasking, obviously. Okay. You get to the slide here. Um, you know, I, I, I would say having, you know, tried to be a little forward looking, never to have gotten it right. So like we didn't expect CRISPR, first of all, that was a discovery, but then it's application to evolve or, or, or get the, it happened so rapidly. Um, and, and, you know, time and again, there are these examples of, of our not having done that um, well at, at all. So I don't know, I, I think evolving tech, emerging and evolving technology is one area and the ethical issues that it drives or that come from it, but that's very general. Um, you know, I, I think AI, uh, big data, data science is that that whole suite of things, um, as they relate to healthcare, but but also much more broadly, raises really interesting ethical issues, and that's going to be a really important area for us, um, for people who do bioethics. Uh, I think the ethical issues at the global health level, among the things that the pandemic has pointed out, is how interconnected the the world is, even if our, you know some leaders of countries are trying to turn things the other way. Um, it's hard to ignore the fact that, you know, borders don't matter when there's a virus mm -hmm. circulating um, and, and climate change and the ethical issues related to that. So I think there's a lot of these very big challenging, you know, wicked problems, as they say, that, that have an ethics component that we will um, need people to work on. So if that's a sort of what to look for for the future kind of answer, that's my best shot.
So one last thing, so you can see all of that social media stuff. I'm very easily found in the Hopkins directory, but my, um, just to tell everybody, my email address is Jeff Kahn, just all run together, J-E-F-F-K-A-H-N at jhu.edu. And you'll find me anyway. <laughs> People do. Yeah. Uh, they will. <laughs> As they will. Um, and I, that's great. I, you know, I, I don't answer everybody immediately, but I do my best to at least respond. Right, right. Uh, well, once again, thank you, Dr. Khan, for joining us today. And thank you to everyone in our audience uh, for listening in. Just be sure to visit our CTY Facebook events page where we're going to be posting more Bright Now series events throughout the year. And uh, when we do adjourn momentarily, you're going to be directed to a CTY webpage where the recording of the webinar is going to be available probably early next week. But again, thank you, Dr. Khan, for everything. It was a pleasure speaking with you and hearing what you're, you're doing and the amazing things that Hopkins is doing that is right next to our campus that you know I don't know about. So thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Likewise, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.